Glory to God. Glory to Jesus. I greet the church and those who visit us with the peace of the Lord. We're going to open our Bibles in Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah 2, from verse 11 onwards. Amen. Is it a little too hot here? Pe people sing so with so much uh, energy that everybody get, gets hot here. Did you find Nehemiah 2, verse 11, says the following. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. I don't know one what my God had told, had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. And I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well and the refuse gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates which were burnt with fire. Then I went on to the uh, fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room to, for the animal under mutual path. So I went up into the night by the valley and viewed the wall. Then I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the of officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the no nobles, the officials, or the others who did the work. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste, and its gates are burnt with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem so that we may not no longer be uh, be a reproach. So let us sing another song. Uh, is it ready? <laughs> Five to eight. So let us. So then don't complain.
Amen. Glory to God. Bless be the name of the Lord. The book about the life of Nehemiah, book of Ezra, and the book of Ezra. And those are books that for many, they're considered books of the restoration. And the moment in which we read here, it speaks exactly of the moment in which Nehemiah, he enters into Jerusalem. Jerusalem, that was, had been destroyed in, the, in ruins. And after S S the King Solomon dies, the nation of Israel, it was divided into two kingdoms. The kingdom of Israel was subdivided into two kingdoms. The North Kingdom with ten tribes called uh, the Kingdom of Israel and the South uh, Kingdom called the Judah Kingdom of Judah with two tribes. Jerusalem was located in the South Kingdom. And it lasted about 200 years for this division to take place. And during those years, many kings took on uh, power. Approximately uh, 20 kings in each of the two regions. And the North region, all the kings, none of the kings served the Lord. Those were kings that allowed paganism to enter into the kingdom, other go gods, the mix mixing with other peoples that served other gods. And the south kingdom was a little better. A few kings served the Lord, and there were also kings that didn't serve the Lord. And during this period, it was a moment which was called the moment of captivity to the Babylonian kingdom. It was when the emperor of the Babylonian kingdom entered into the south kingdom and pillaged Jerusalem and took captive their inhabitants, the ones that were not killed. And this period was called the period of uh, Babylonian captivity lasted, it lasted about 70 years, more or less. And during this period, the people stayed outside of Jerusalem. So after those 70 years, the, uh, Mid um, the, the Persian Empire took control of uh, the Babylonian Kingdom and, and the King Cyrus he authorized <laughs> that the first, the ones that have been exiled, the ones that were captive, to go back to Jerusalem. A group came back. They went back to reconstruct Jerusalem. They didn't go uh, very far ahead because it was a poor people without many resources. And after 59 years, Esdras, Ezra, Ezra begins a new, a new um, um, process of uh, return to Jerusalem. Ezra, he brought uh, a little bit of res financial resources, and now he begins the reconstruction of the temple. During this period. They began to rebuild the city, the reconstruction of the temple. They didn't finish it. And now, after 13 years, that Ezra had left Jerusalem with the second part of the group of the captive, now Nehemiah comes. That's where we are here. 13 years afterwards, 142 years, Jerusalem was 
it was left uh, abandoned completely uh, unprotected with nobody ahead of the people without any structure for the people to survive Ezra during the period in which he lived Ezra was a priest he began to bring once again people back to God's feet and the law of Moses and what was the service to the Lord but he was not very successful with that because of the difficulties uh, of the resources and the oppression that existed and the rejection the opposition and now Nehemiah when he hears about how what was happening in Jerusalem Nehemiah comes to Jerusalem with a small group to restore the walls and the walls uh, the gates of Jerusalem and when Nehemiah comes I said here he he stayed three days without saying anything without doing anything and then he enters into Jerusalem and begins to do an estimate of what needed to be done to the 12 doors have been burnt on fire and now Nehemiah in the silence only with his men the ones that were closest to him now in verse 17 when he decides now to make a pronouncement to the people Nehemiah says you see the distress that we are in because what Nehemiah saw was in fact was a situation that was very difficult the people hungry living um, and with neglect uh, for sure with disease a people that was a people of God a people that saw miracles a people that saw the Red Sea opening up people that saw the powerful hands of God operating on their behalf they are now living in a situation like this and Amaiah now says you see the distress that we are in my brethren what Nehemiah saw was exactly it is exactly what we see out there in the world the comparison here prophetically speaking what God wants to show us tonight is to bring to the memory to bring to our understanding, to bring to us the situation in which the world is. The world today, which is considered the evangelical world, a large part of the population here in this country, especially, they're considered uh, the gospel. In Brazil, the, the evangelical group grows up every day. The gospel today, through the media, is being preached. The church, they, they are making themselves available to preach the gospel. And the group, the evangelical group, is uh, growing. But now I ask a question to the brethren. Is it possible that the group of saved, the number of saved, is it growing as well? Or is simply people that are getting used to the gospel people that are getting used to this uh, Christian environment are people that use the name gospel and people that use the Bible just to label themselves Christians but they are not enjoying or they are not take possession of what is the true gospel of what is the true project of God for the salvation of man because what we see here around us is exactly this evangelical leaders they are more worried with themselves humanly speaking and the financial uh, aspect and the material side and with the soul of the people people that are calling themselves leaders and evangelical leaders but they are doing so many things that are away from the word that we can even say that as Nehemiah says we are living in misery people that are dying spiritually 
people there are they are not feeding themselves in what is the true gospel and what is the eternal gospel that was left for God uh, by God to for the church and people they're living every day in their churches but they're living like if they were outside of the church bringing the world inside of the church people there are dying people that are with all the appar spiritual apparatus and they have a praise group they have they have a choir in their church with all this all those resources but they don't they are not leading their lives they are not bringing their lives into a sanctification people that are not worried with the spiritual aspect but they are only worried with what is the name, which is the label, the title of being called, of being labeled uh, uh, Christians. Jerusalem was being built. Jerusalem was being restored. But still there was inside of Jerusalem what was the worst thing, which, which was the shame, was the discomfort of being called a people, called the people of God, but the people that was now living in want, people that was living at the mercy of the help, and what the time could simply, the time could give them. But now Nehemiah, he is concerned with this. Nehemiah, he now brings to Jerusalem, he together with Ezra, the spiritual side of the people, the obedience to the Lord, the obedience to hearing the voice of God, the obedience of be seeking the God of Israel, the obedience of answering to what God is saying to His people. Nehemiah has been raised by God to do this, to bring the restoration, not only of what is material, here, we are speaking in a symbolic way. But today, God has risen Nehemiah in our midst. God, today, in the last days, God has risen men, women, youth, children that are preaching the gospel, but not the gospel that brings to them the selfish benefits, but not the gospel that will... Uh, uh, increase the bank accounts but that will bring riches to a denomination today's church and on the side of the gospel is very far away from what the primitive church was in the times of Paul in times of Peter in times of John where the Holy Spirit was being poured out where the Pentecost took place what the Lord visited their hearts, what they preached, and thousands of lives surrendered to the Lord, where people wanted to, uh, people wanted to bring that the seek, so that even the shadow of Peter, of the servant of the Lord, if the, their shadow passed upon them, they would be healed. The gospel today is very far from that. Of people that died in the arenas in love for God. People that preached that Jesus was alive. People that gave their lives for love of the gospel. Because they have been received a call, not a call from man, but was a call from God. People that were giving everything that they had, letting go of everything in order to do the work of the Lord. And what we see today is very far away from this. Peter, uh, Peter once, when he was approached by a paralytic, he said, I don't have silver or gold. What I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. They didn't have anything. But they have the power of God. They have fellowship with God. They had intimacy with God. And what we see today is the opposite. 
ch rich churches, they have silver and gold, they have everything, but they don't have, they don't have the power of God. My brethren, we cannot live the gospel in this way. The Lord has called us in order to live a gospel according to the will of God. We cannot live the gospel as it's being preached in the world, in the way it's being preached today. To quench to the thirst and the hunger of the leaders. But we need to go deeper into the project of God. We need to make a difference. We are living the church of the end, the church of the time called soon. The church, church that preaches that Jesus is alive, the primitive church preached that Jesus was alive, and our message today is that Jesus is returning, and is returning independent of my will or, or, or your will. Jesus is coming. Independent, uh, it's independent of uh, me being prepared or not, God will return whether you are prepared or not. God will come whether you believe in it or not. Jesus is coming. We don't know the day, but we know that He will return. And the world needs to be confronted with the Word. The faithful church today need to proclaim that Jesus is coming. You know why? Because what will change the man, what will change the sinner, or change the, the uh, knowledge and the conscience of man is the Word of God. That's why the church needs to preach, preach the Gospel. It needs to proclaim the Word. The church needs to learn the Word. The church needs to live the Word. The church needs every day know more and more the mysteries of God. Because when man is confronted with the Word and he knows the truth and the truth shall free man, and the word says, you sh and you shall know the truth, and it shoots, truth shall set you free. And everything that is going to change man's mind, and everything that is going to change man's heart and allow man to leave sin and enter into the path of God is the sacrifice of Jesus, is him knowing Jesus. You know him knowing a beautiful, uh, rich temple or going to an environment where he will see beautiful things. That's none of it. This was not, not going to save anyone. Our concern is exactly with this. Nehemiah entered and he saw the misery that was in Jerusalem. Destroyed. Neglected. The destruction. In the same way, the Lord has called us so that we may be preachers of the, the word. Proclaimers. Because we cannot have people inside of the church, people that are being deceived, people deceiving themselves, people thinking that they are deceiving the pastor, think that they are deceiving the deacons, but they are actually deceiving themselves. Youth that are thinking that they are deceiving their parents, but they are deceiving themselves. Youth that are living inside of the church, doing absurd uh, absurdities. They are not taking seriously the chance, the opportunity that God has given them. Brad, we need to, s we, we cannot see things like this happening in the church and think that this, this is normal. We, we need to be like Nehemiah. We need to see this situation, the city, and feel in our hearts the pain, the suffering of a father has seen his, his son or daughter going through uh, the wrong direction. We need to intercede to the Lord. We have this call from the Lord, and for us, we cannot accept this and not get used to this. We cannot accept it. We cannot see our youth, our couples, our children going to tortuous paths, thinking that they are deceiving us, but they are deceiving themselves. In the same way that God rose Nehemiah and Ezra and many others, God has risen us. The opposition will always have them. Nehemiah found opposition. He fought opposition. He overcame the opposition. 
That's why the Son of God in these last days needs to be bold. Opposition will always arise, but we cannot um, uh, defeat ourselves. We cannot let the opposition, the attack, and the trial be stronger than our commitment with God, because it was God who called us. A high price was paid. In the same way that God has restored, God allowed the restoration of Jerusalem, God also wants to, re tonight, He wants to restore many who are here. If your life is like in Jerusalem, if your home is like in Jerusalem, the walls falling down, the gates burnt on fire, living in difficult moments, if your life is a life of misery, if your life is a life of defeat, if your life is a life of anguish and suffering and losses, tonight the Lord is going to restore your life. Tonight, God wants to give you another opportunity. Open up your heart and allow God to inhabit it. Open up your heart and allow the Lord to transform your life. There's no time left for us to live a life in a church with one foot in the church and another in the world. We cannot continue like that. We cannot play uh, play uh, with gospel. We cannot allow the gates to be burnt on fire. We need to restore the walls. We need to restore the the gates. We need to rebuild the temple. We need to allow the spiritual level, mine, yours, of our church in Pampana, be a high level in, before the Lord, so that the Holy Spirit may find a place to operate in the same way that is the Holy Spirit operated in the primitive church, so that whenever somebody comes here, to, they may feel the power of God, they may feel the visitation of the Holy Spirit, and they may leave this place blessed, transformed, and not live in this place in the same way they entered. I'm not speaking only for the visitors, but also for the church, for the servants, for the ones that already know the Lord, for the ones that have already had an experience of the Lord, for the ones who have already heard the voice of the Lord, for the ones who have had a, a call from the Lord, for the ones that have chosen to serve the Lord. But today I live in a life of misery, spiritually speaking. A life where the Lord doesn't have freedom to speak with them. Where they do no, no longer consult the Lord. What they share with the Lord, what they are feeling. What they are going through, their necessities, their plans, their projects. You cannot live like that. The Lord has given us the opportunity. Jerusalem has been for many years desolated and destroyed. But tonight is a night of restoration. Tonight the Lord wants to cause you to recognize that there is a God that is alive, a God that follows us, a God that loves us, because His mercy, His love. Amen. May God bless us. And I ask you that you may be praying speaking with the Lord and while the brethren are singing you, you, you need to place your life in the altar of God you need to place your necessity what you have what you need to fix up you need to fix your life well not all here but if you think that you need to confess to the Lord seek the Lord a new commitment a new pact you need to place this uh, on the altar of God we are here but what what is the most important is the presence of God, which is real in this place.
invite the church to stand up come therefore and so let us edify the walls of Jerusalem so let so where we will not no longer be in harmful way the song that we just sang the those songs are challenged come come the Lord Jesus is coming those songs they need to speak to our hearts Are you ready to meet with Jesus? Is this that you want? You want to inhabit in heavenly Jerusalem? Are you ready, really ready from the bottom of our heart to say, come Jesus? Not all are ready, sadly. Many they are inside of the church, but they are afraid. They are afraid of this day. Many. But tonight, the Lord, He wants to change this. Tonight, the Lord wants to give to you this assurance that if He arrives today, your name is going to be one of those that are going to be called. And you don't, cannot leave this place if you have any doubt about your salvation, if you feel a concern, if you don't have this assurance, then you cannot, lo cannot leave this place still with doubt in your heart. The call of the Lord tonight is come. Let us edify the walls. Let us remove the hindrance 
Let's remove the despise, the shame, everything that the shame. Remove everything. And you may be able to leave this place with this assurance that if Jesus comes in three seconds or right now, we will be with him in eternity. The service today, God wants to do this because God has shown that there are people here that are inside of the church, but they are living a life of sin. They are living a life where it's not in agreement with the servant of God. Sin, we are all sinners. But what is worst is the practice of sin. It's not possible for us to run away from sin. But the practice of sin is what takes the servant of God from the presence of God and cancels the operation of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in their lives. But tonight, God wants to give to you. It's not a, it's a story of small and large sin. For God, sin is a sin. The story of large or small sin it doesn't exist. It doesn't matter whether you're deceiving people, if you're living a double life, or if you're living a life that is not in agreement with what is written in the gospel. You need tonight to hear from the part of the Lord the truth. And the truth is, if Jesus comes and you are like this, you are not going to go up. That's the truth. We are saying this truth so that the truth might, might set you free. Because we need to bring this topic about salvation seriously. We need to take this topic seriously. There is no second chance. If Jesus comes today and you do not go with him, it's over. My brother, that's serious. In the same way that Nehemiah, he felt hurting his heart. Nehemiah cried for his people for the mercy, misery that it was the people was going through. You need to be also awoken by God in order for you to stop and think and place your life before the altar of God. And that's what God wants to do tonight.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to have a word of glorification to the Lord. Lord, we praise you for your word. It comes from eternity, Lord. We pray that will cause us to be valiant servants, Lord. We're the one who gave your life, Lord, for our salvation, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We want to be with you in eternity, Lord, with our church. Your church desire for this moment. We want to be ready, Lord. Prepare us, Lord. Make us into valiant servants, Lord, because we want to be with your work, Lord. Cause us to love us one another, Lord, so that we can love you more, Lord. Your servants, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this moment of your word we pray to you thank you for your grace which has been enough for us Lord receive our adoration so that you serve it Lord your word the praises that have been sang the prayers that have been made the ones that have been said out loud but also the ones that uh, remain in the depth of their hearts we, so that you may hear them and you answer them with power and that your word may bring transformation of lives and that your word may bring Lord an understanding regarding the moment in which we are living and that we may leave your house closer to you Lord take us home in peace so that we may have a week of victories in your presence the prayer that we say in the name of Jesus in your name we say that the wonderful, the wonderful grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, our eternal Father, the sweet and tender consolations of the Holy Spirit, and the gifts of the Spirit be poured out upon all of us now and forevermore. Amen. The church may be seated. We're going to be here at your disposal, the ushers, deacons, and pastors. The women also can help out and give you assisting in whatever you need. If you feel in your heart, then you need to ask a prayer to the Lord. We are here to do this. Amen. Do not leave this place in the same way you entered. Tonight's a night of change, a night of restoration, whether youth, adolescent, or elderly, whatever, whoever you might be, married, uh, single, it doesn't matter. The Lord wants you to leave this place closer to Him. Amen. Peace of the Lord.